I V M. There was a time when the words journalism, advertising, and content were all looked at as far-off cousins, but today they're all joined at the hip. That's because not only is content today all-encompassing, but also brands need to be part of relevant content that is both credible yet engaging. That's why the word journalist is too narrow to describe the editorial landscape. And to have an editorial mindset is so important for anyone to be relevant, either as a creator, advertiser, platform, or a brand, especially in today's world. This shift in focus has been championed by media powerhouses like Vice, and that's why I'm super happy to have Ritu Barna Som, editor in chief of Vice India, with me today. This is Advertising is Dead, and I'm Varun Dugirala, co-founder and corner chief of the Glitch. We'll be back right after this break. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another awesome week on IVM Podcast. If you aren't following us on social media, please make sure you do. We're IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. On Instagram, we've been doing an interesting thing recently. What we're trying to do is whenever a listener is listening, they take a screenshot of what they're listening to, they make a comment, and they tag us on it. And we're reposting that on all of our stories. So, I mean, like, if you want to get on our feed, then please do tag us. And otherwise, if you want to see what other people are listening, then go and check out the Instagram account and you can take a look at that. On The Scene and the Unseen, Amit Verma talks to writer Gyan Prakash about his new book about Indira Gandhi and the emergency. On the Prakati podcast, we have a two-episode special that demystifies the ongoing economic conflict between the U.S. and China. Last week, we launched a brand new Hindi podcast called Cinemaya. It's hosted by Swati Bakshi and our first guest is Nandita Das. She discusses her journey as a woman filmmaker in a male-dominated industry. On Vartha Lab, Naveen and Akash talk to comedian Nivetita Prakasam and remember their favorite heckling stories. On our Kannada podcast, Thalya Arate, the host discuss how the Kannada language and culture is faring on the far side of the world. On Pesa Vesa, CEO of Edelweiss Asset Management, Radhika Gupta joins Anupam to discuss asset allocation and its importance. And with that, let's continue on with your show. Welcome back to Advertising is Dead. I'm Varun Dugirala, co-founder and content chief at The Glitch. And today I have Ritu Parna Som, editor-in-chief of Vice India with me. Yeah, it's a very fancy title for a role that is mostly janitorial. But yeah. I, that's actually what was going to be my next question. What does an editor-in-chief at Vice India do? Uh, mostly cleans up everything that you see that finally goes online or what the final product is. Takes the blame for everything. And then says magnanimous things like, oh, this is all due to the team effort and it's all teamwork. It's all great going. Thanks to the team. That's my role. So the janitor thing stays, I'm guessing. To call myself the janitor has been one of my pet peeves for ages. And I'm happy there are more of us who call ourselves janitors because that's actually what we do. It is. And let's not like make it any more glamorous than it is. It is exactly that. (laughs) How did you end up here if I want to go back to that first because the idea of this podcast also is trying to figure out um, the journeys people take to kind of get to where they are right now um, you were a D- I think when I um, I wouldn't I ran through your LinkedIn profile it's okay and DNA content asked Grazia and then why so how, how, how has that journey um, how has that happened well, um, I started off with newspapers, actually. I was with Asian Age for about two years, where it, that's kind of where I understood content for the first time, given a very free reign to do lifestyle and culture. And that's when I figured, hey, my life can be translated into a job. Where, and then I went to Channel V. I was there for two years, where I realized, maybe television isn't the place where I want to be because the editing rooms were really cold. <laughs> and um, people wanted... Um, People wanted 24-7 of your lives at yeah. that point. Yeah. This is in 2000. That, that, has, that hasn't changed. Uh, yeah, exactly. So yeah. I was like, nope, nope, nope. I want a bigger life. Yeah. And then I went back to journalism. And uh, and I say I use the word journalism very loosely because I feel that definition has also changed. So it's no longer just about uh, being a reporter. It's also about creating content that people want to read, people want to be yeah. immersed yeah. in. And yeah. that's what I was interested in. And so then when I eventually got back to it with DNA, when we launched After Hours, which was again a lifestyle and culture yeah, supplement, yeah. I was covering theater and art there. And uh, then moving on to Vogue, where I was in the features division, their department. And again, these were just extensions of a life that I was already leading. So it never felt like work. Yeah. So I wouldn't go so far as to say that, yes, I went to work with a happy, smiley face, with this joy in my heart, skip in my step, etc. No, work is still work. So it's still going to, you're still going to have bad days. You're still going to be like, F- this shit, I am not going to do this anymore. <laughs> but it's still something I enjoy and it's still a privilege. So, um, so yeah, so Vogue happened. And then I took a year off because I was like, you know what, 10 years of working, I need a break, mm-hmm. and I went on a very. I still haven't done that. I don't think I. I, I don't think I'll ever. 
I didn't think I'll ever be able to do that. I don't know why. I don't know how I did it. I had a lot of very supportive editors, friends, family who were just like, do it, do it. And I took a break and I went and did my master's in something very irrelevant in the larger look of that larger scheme of work, which is a master's in critical theory and creative yeah. writing. I had a great time, came back and decided I can't be jobless even for a second. <laughs> <laughs> so, and that's when I joined Grazia and that's been my longest running job for and I think I was there for about eight years where I really learned to, where I really learned to kind of create content, cater to a particular kind of people and even the transition all the slow from print to digital kind of happened at that yeah. time because we also started our website at that point and understanding that what's working on print is not necessarily ever going to work on digital etc yeah. etc yeah. et and then vice <laughs> it's been oh god it feels very long but actually it hasn't really been that long no it's, it's, it's interesting what you said a little early on right you, you spoke about the fact that uh, journalism you use the words journalism and content in the same space and i think like if i go way back when i was in media school um, the fact that you would break up people who are in journalism and audiovisual and and and, and production keep them separate because um, that was generally supposed to be two different spheres and journalists would focus on the serious stuff and i remember going back home and uh, someone from my family asked me so when i and i and i was interning at mtv and someone said so when are you going to go do some serious journalism right uh, i think serious and journalism have always been tagged together but it, i think journalism is the core of all forms of content you actually researching you putting that stuff together Absolutely. And just because I'm talking about, um, I don't know, a, a red lipstick yeah. th- and just because I'm talking about, say, a concert I attended last night doesn't make it any less serious than, um, I don't know, a bus strike that's happening. Yes, the level yeah. of seriousness yeah. in terms of what the demands are and uh, what how how many lives they're affecting and how they're affecting lives. Yes, that differs. But the point is, it's still content that you're consuming. In the morning when you wake up, you're going to read the headlines. You're going to read. You're going to scroll through Instagram. You're going to read your. If you're old enough, you're going to read your Facebook posts. <laughs> <laughs> or young enough, I don't know. Is anybody on Facebook anymore? I don't know. Everybody's and on Facebook, but they just claim they're not. True. I, that's actually the the truth. Also, because all our parents are on Facebook that's at the true. same time, that's so true. yeah, that that's the problem. Anyway, um, so yeah, so content is king at the end of the day. So whether you're, it doesn't matter what you're creating. Somebody's blog is content. Somebody can call themselves, I don't know, like you're making a diary public. That becomes content. Like when did that happen? You know, art and culture sometimes always feel like the lower end of the stick, right? And, and like just taking off from what you were just talking about and. The fact is that I think art and culture are more relevant now in terms of just any kind of, I wouldn't say public discourse, I think in terms of any form of creation, uh, because everything else starts getting, I, I, I wouldn't like to use the term, but it's like the machines taking over on, on everything else. Uh, and and so it's, it's a lot more relevant now to be able to create the kind of content, be it, uh, be it editorial in terms of print, be it something that you, you're creating as a video, even as a podcast, like what we're doing right now. Um, that is, is so core. Um, do you feel there are enough people who look at it and from that wider stance um, or, or is everyone trying to do too many things in terms of in, on a very focused manner because you know I, I find many times people saying oh I want to do specifically this kind of um, content um, but is the wide ranging stuff what is what is required right now? I think there's an audience for everything mm. because you. I, I think it's unfair to generalize and say only this works or only that works. Yeah, yeah. Um Take mental health, for example. Yeah. It's um, it's a vice pillar. It's something that we feel very passionately about, especially for uh, a young part of our population, which is large a large part of our country. And I feel there is a space for hard-hitting, statistically-led pieces that you will read in your newspapers. Mm-hmm. There is also a space for illustrations that we find on our Instagram sco- scrolls, yeah. where there are a lot of young people who are being very... Uh, very precise and very magnanimous with their own feelings, mm. therefore inviting a little community outreach in their own way, building mini micro communities amongst themselves. And that's what the internet has done. It has created this sort of safe space as well. Yeah. We all talk about Twitter being a toxic space. We all talk about 
even um, about trolls and about how that can play so so heavily on your own mental health, on your own mental space. But you, we also talk about the fact that, you know, tomorrow I have five accounts that tell me about anxiety and how mm. to deal with it. Yeah. Um, I can go to as terrible as WebMD is, it might provide me with a certain amount of yeah, direction yeah, if I'm yeah, feeling lost. Yeah. Um, there is a certain amount of stigma attached to topics that I can't talk about in mainstream media that I will find on somebody's um, on somebody's blog, perhaps. Yeah. So there is an audience for everything. Uh, personally, for me, I will read a lot of it. I will read the blog. I will read the newspaper. I will go through the Instagram accounts. And all of them will be relevant for me in very different ways. So, yeah, I don't think there's any specific space or a specific way to talk about things yeah. we are just widening the way we are doing it yeah. and therefore hopefully bringing in more people into the conversation and that is in many ways the essence of what vice is right is the fact that they, it's 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 what popular culture is right now be it about uh, stuff that are, that is slightly more on the serious side be it stuff that is more relevant from a generalized culture standpoint from um, I hate the term millennial because I, I do think that that's a weird term I'm born in 82 that means I'm technically on the border I'm year one of being millennial that's why you hate the term you don't want to be a millennial it's, that's it's, and I, don't, I don't get it I, mean, I, I think we, they're now talking about Gen Z and, and everything else and I think the whole point is that it's about is is Weiss Weiss's philosophy really what all form of content philosophy you know is, is that what it is what is what is Weiss's philosophy I would like to say we have a lot of filters in terms of the kind of audience we're talking to uh, the kind of content we're talking about etc but a lot of it is a work in progress. A lot of it is evolutionary. We are only eight to nine months old. Mm. And India is a very complicated space to make content in. Mm. Number one, we're huge consumers of content. Number two, not that great content has been created in the last couple of years, ever since yeah. the internet exploded yeah. in our faces. And number three is we are a country made up of many little countries. Yeah. So whether we're looking at communities, languages, whether we're looking at interests, class, uh, caste, religion, everything is different. Everything we are coming from very, very different spaces. So there is no common theme that I can say this works and that yeah, works. Yeah. So even for us, it's been a learning process and I don't think that will ever change. The moment a content company decides that, yes, this is it, we've learned everything and, you know, yeah. You're, you're ringing your death knell for yourself at that point, 100%. right? So, yeah, I, I would say it's always work in progress. Always, and it should be. What have you seen as as relevant pieces that do work as content for, for on the digital front for the Indian audience um, or rather the audience that you primarily focus on? I feel there are two topics that have worked very well for us. Not actually lots, but these two stand out for me because I personally feel very invested in them. Three, actually. Uh, one is sex. Mm -hmm. Because we're a country that we're a shy country. Yeah, we are also a country that's very confused. So all of this works together and creates this wall when it comes to information on sex. Yeah, and I'm talking yeah. about information. I'm not talking yeah, about yeah. Pornhub. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so Pornhub people will go to. Uh, it's don't the information. Just it, 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 it's it's the, you know it, they will go to, but the information is what they're worried about getting, right? <laughs> So there's a lot of misinformation. There's a lot of misguidance. And you. so we did. So July last year was the year we focused our conversation on sex. We had a whole series called Sex Rated where we had a series of documentaries as well as a whole lot of editorial. Um, it was so surprising even for, you know, people who I mean, we thought we knew everything about India and sex. Yeah. And, you know, we were, ev every day was like, what? Are you serious? This yeah. happens? Yeah. 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 So, uh, you know, whether it's BDSM society. Societies that are in your neighborhood. Um, I was or, surprised with some of yeah, the stats. I was yeah. like, what? Whether that's that or whether it's um, neck massages, which are actually amazing vibrators, <laughs> whether it's being sold on every nook, at every like small chotu shop. If you look around, you'll find it. And or even if it's um, fantasy novels being translated and role played into sexual fantasies, mm. you know. So that was a huge revelation for us as well as for our audience. And um, so that was one. The second was LGBTQ. Mm -hmm. um, what I felt very angry about is that a lot of media has jumped onto this as a sort of trending topic. It's very yeah. cool to include this community and to talk about them. Yes, yes. Last year was a seminal year yeah. for sure. But the thing is... Don't make it a gimmick. Exactly. And I feel very 
upset about it. So yeah. even advice, I mean, for, from the video team as, as and the editorial team, our main thing has been to be part of the community as as far as they allow it. Yeah. Do not jump onto it and be like, oh, let's just talk about this community because yeah. it's, you know, it's cool to do so. And no, there, there are serious problems. The more you normalize there. things, the, 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 the more you're including them, right? Once you make them, oh, wow, let's, let's talk about them. Then it's only like... That is, that is one, one of my favorite words. Is to, and that's what I want to do advice. Like, you know, you have to normalize these conversations. Only then will you have less stigma. Only then, I mean, the ideal world. Yeah. I don't <laughs> maybe another 50 years, but I don't know. But at least we'll try. And we want to, we don't want to be the ones talking about it. We want the community to talk about it. And we just want to be the conduit. So mm. it it cannot be colored from our perceptions, right? That was the second thing that was quite revelatory. The third was also mental health. Again, something that's it every everybody is affected by it. Whether you want to admit it, understand it, acknowledge it, it's it's rampant, it's unaddressed, yeah. and um, and people want to talk about it. Yeah. Young people especially want to talk about it. Because the perception always was that you know, if you if you have a mental health issue, that straight up you've yeah, yeah it's, you're pagal or yeah. you're you you're not functioning in society or you're yeah. not allowed to function in society. Yeah. That's rubbish. All of us are dealing with some shit or the other, and yeah. we're perfectly fine doing our jobs working you know our way into life etc but that doesn't mean we don't deserve a chance to feel better about ourselves yeah. you know yeah. so and it is a hard world yeah. it, there is there are more challenges that will crop up every day yeah. um, if we can provide a few tools to help people along the way mm-hmm. I'd like to think we'd like to do that yeah and, and when we were talking about normalize right I think that word kind of rung with both of us um, if you look at how any form of journalistic content is treated right now. If you look at mainstream media, you look at, I would say to some part, even large amount of the newspapers. Sensationalize versus normalize um, is a thing. So the more I see newer forms of, of content being created um, to give people information, I think journalism is actually the information content space. Um, on digital, I'm, I've, I've noticed over the last one year that the... I, I think it started, I wouldn't say it started with you guys, but I think it's around the same time, right, with, with Vice India. Um, now when I see stuff which which Quinn puts out, which the print puts out, all in different spaces, but everything's a lot more, it's a very different way of giving the information, right? Is that the way in which consumers are consuming news content online uh, versus mainstream media? Or, or do you say that there's still like masses versus slightly more urban audiences? That's a difficult one to answer because on one hand, I'd like to think that we're not, we don't want to be, um, we don't want to be catering to the masses purely to cater to their interests Mm -hmm. only, right? Mm -hmm. Because in that case, we'll be only doing Bollywood content. Uh, But at the same time, we want to be attuned to what they want. Just because they consume a lot of Bollywood doesn't mean that they're not going to be interested in a UFO expert, yeah, yeah, you know. So yeah. in terms of deciding what we put out there, yeah, yeah we do need to maintain that balance. We yeah. can't ignore the masses yeah. and what they want. At the same time, we can't assume that they will not like a specific kind yeah. of content. Crime, for example, is always going to play really yeah. well. And yeah. last uh, last month yeah. was our crime focus where we did this whole series called Curse a Crime. Yeah, yeah. And, and it was very hyper local it was very yeah it was a tiny focus on a tiny spot literally but it did really well because everybody crime is a universal topic yeah right yeah. whether you're looking at a podcast like um serial yeah yeah and um in fact some of the most well-known and famous podcasts are true crime yeah. uh, na- narratives yeah. right so crime is always going to be so that's the sort of like the sweet spot between what the masses want and what we want to talk about as yeah. well but at the same time, sex is always going to sell whether in whatever way you kind of put it across. Yeah. So we also need to fine tune the way we do it. So, you know, whether we're doing videos, mini videos, small documentaries, whether we're doing an editorial, whether we're doing a quiz. Yeah. That's the challenge and that's that's nice and fun. But yeah, it's a complicated, difficult so, question. So when you talk about, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah so I know. It's, it's, it's one of those things, it's... it's it, I find it to be such an interesting conversation because it's there's so many different ways to look at it and it's constantly evolving. Um, it's evolving in a in a good uh, in a good way in certain spaces, but also getting worse in, in some spaces. Um, talking about curse a crime, right? Um, and and I thought that was an interesting way in which Mirzapur is a property kind of got intertwined. Um, 
for brands or platforms etc to now because there was a time it was simple right you buy an ad spot put it before uh, be- before a piece of content uh, again buy an buy an uh, a print spot kind of put it between all the news um, world the world has changed for brands and and advertisers and how they need to function how they need to do um, there was a sense of control they always had um, in terms of everything that they would do um, now they need to learn to be collaborative now they need to learn how to blend into the content and not seem like a blatant plug um what are the filters that uh, if i was a brand today and i wanted to work with vice and what would my filters have to be um, because i think uh, i remember the bullshit filter line about uh, vice i think it's important to kind of filter through the bullshit i think this is what you need to be to be a part of a relevant piece of content i think the first thing that people what's happened is that we've lost trust yeah. right we've lost trust in media in companies in the government we've just lost trust so any any kind of direct messaging that comes from these either of these three we're going to question we're going to be like no i'm sorry th- this is not true there's also a huge glut of information that's coming our way all the mm-hmm. time so if tomorrow one brand says choose us over this guy we're going to be like that's rubbish because you're like exactly the same so you know what are you talking about yeah. so the point is your messaging therefore has to be very authentic right and it also needs to come I think culture is the main filter that you're looking at because that's your main USP. That's how you that's why we kind of we work with brands that feel our culture, that understand that you know we're going to be talking a certain way, we're going to be talking about certain topics yeah. and uh, therefore it's a seamless blend, which is why Kelsey Crime worked. It's a seamless thing. It's it's a yeah. topic that we It just felt so like, yeah. Yeah, it's a topic that we felt worked for us. It's a topic that we would have anyway done. and it's great that a brand came on board to give us that push and access as well you know so when we went to mirzapur to shoot it 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 was just it was an amazing experience we went there thinking maybe we'll get three or four stories we got 15 20 stories you know so again culture is the filter so you you need to look at how people are consuming it and therefore apply that and see how that culture works for you Do you see openness to guardrails being a problem because sometimes all content needs to have certain guardrails or saying okay fine don't touch that um don't change this these are spots in which i think and and that goes both ways right it's it's like um i like to call it like it's like it's like a weird form of tinder where brands and creators need to come together but you got to find that right match it's about saying the fact that okay a the brand should get lost uh but also the content shouldn't suddenly seem like a like an ad spot so how do you find that blend and what are those right um Well, and it's Tinder for content. yeah, but like it it would be different for for every brand, right? I mean, yeah. I can't speak for everything that we've done so far, honestly, because a lot of them have been video content, so the conversations there have been a la a larger conversation there. But I think what has happened is that brands also recognize that you can't come in and say I want this, 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 but you can't do this, this, this. It has to be a discussion. Yeah. Uh, so it's a sweet spot that's constantly being negotiated, yeah. right? and they also come in with the understanding that we're not going to be just executing yeah. there is a amount of creative control we will want on it mm-hmm. so that's been a big learning for the brands i suppose mm-hmm. like for example kanchanjunga calling which mm-hmm. was this big project that we did with mountain dew mm-hmm. rithik roshan scaling a fake mountain did not work for them mm-hmm. i mean for obvious reasons mm-hmm. the audience is far more evolved than that yeah. arjun vachpai who could be you who could be me who could be my next door neighbor yeah talking through frostbitten lips yeah. talking about his actual achievement yeah. is a much hard hitting yeah. uh, much more uh, it's a story that will resonate a lot Feels stronger real, exactly is, yeah. and that works as a campaign that's the sweet spot that we got there right yeah. because of something that we would have it's very wise yeah. and it's also very mountain dew for them you know it worked True. for them True. so yeah and it'll differ from brand to brand yeah. so 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 if today i wanted to work and i'm taking a step back and i talk to people primarily i think even when people want to get into uh the media space um the the requirements now are multiple right uh, so if i if i wanted to work at vice um it's not just i would work on a, a certain kind of thing what are the different things that someone could do at vice <laughs> think about it it's i know that the janitor position is taken what else can cuz you know the question lot is oh i want to work in a certain place which means the conceived notion there are all of two things that are going to be my job profile right so uh, but the reality is there are 50 things you could do there are 50 things and there is no such thing like you know how normal companies would have job profiles and job descriptions being set yeah. out we write our own because yeah. at any given point 
that each one is doing 15 different things yeah. and they can they're not entire like it's not like i'm doing this as well as doing editing no it's like a bit of this a bit of this mm. a bit of this yeah. so it's, i feel that's the modern company as well you yeah. cannot be restricted by these are my skill sets and that's all i'm going to do yeah. you are going to become redundant and not necessary in a couple of years in that sense yeah. right so the point is to a constantly learn like last week the last week of december we had a whole lot of workshops mm. where the editing team came and taught all of us how to edit basic yeah. edits uh, the camera team taught us how to shoot um, I did a grammar workshop which just turned out to be a big joke but anyway <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so th- uh, even the graphics team came out and taught us basics of photoshop you know the point is you have to a you have to be open yeah. to learning different skill sets and b you have to be open to seeing how you can utilize that to make your job job profile something else entirely yeah. and even after a job advice like vice is not the end game right even after this you have to create a role for yourself because that's what like what you did with glitch as well y'all created this thing that y'all realized there's this little empty space but you're not sure who's going to fill it yeah. we'll fill it but we're not sure what we're going to do within it and that yeah. process evolved keep over the years keep, keep exactly. changing yeah I, the, and I've noticed this a lot uh, with the prison space is that people who come in, like you said, with, with oh, I will only do this um, and refuse to evolve, end up in, in standardized roles and eventually move on to places which require standardized roles. Um, but to be a true creator or to be part of any media landscape now, you need to be able to like, like everyone should know how to read a contract. Um, I find it appalling many times that people cannot read contracts. I get anxiety if I see paperwork. I, that is one skill that I haven't mastered. So like now I can read a contract as much as any lawyer can. I've I've done that for nine years. I can read it. So, But, but it's not about saying, oh, I've suddenly become a lawyer. You not become that, but you, you're able to have that conversation. So the largest part is that you should be able to have a conversation with every single aspect of your business and, and not seem like a person who doesn't know what they're talking about. I think that's the real requirement now. Exactly. You don't have to be an expert, yeah. but you do need to know how it works yeah. so tomorrow yeah like I, I I sign contracts with my freelancers etc and it takes me the first time I read it it took me I think a few weeks to understand yeah. what was going on yeah. and you know okay ever since then it's not like I read through every contract <laughs> because you know a lot of it is copy pasted but I it's not a matter of I need to know know everything or I need to control everything yeah. it's just a matter of tomorrow if I have to set up my own company and draw up my own contracts I should be able to have that own skill yeah. set in yeah. me and I shouldn't be able to yeah. I shouldn't have to feel lacking or inadequate because yeah. I'm like, oh shit, I don't have a lawyer, therefore yeah. I can't do anything. Yeah. No. I've also, uh, in my extensive research uh, before this recording, uh, because you and I were on a Red Bull video together oh, talking God. about work-life balance. And oh, since no. you brought a work-life <laughs> no. balance in the beginning of it, uh, there's this amazing quote that you said, which I promised you I will use oh, on this God, podcast. Oh why? <laughs> where you said, my mind is like potty, it just flows. <laughs> Please tell us more about that no, quote. No, no, no. <laughs> this is taken out of context. One of the biggest fears of journalism. <laughs> quotes being taken out of context. I like I like how that's come and hit me. Um, what did I say that in relation to? I don't know. I, uh, I, what do you do? I think it was when I... I, I, I think it was about what you do when you have writer's block and what do I do to unblock it or something. This is getting into a very euphemistic conversation. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, see, okay. Maybe, maybe it was about when ideas do come through, they flow. Yeah. And when they don't, they don't. Yeah. And and, and taking from there, because, you know, one of the first things you spoke about was the fact that you took a break, work-life balance. You also spoke about the fact that work is work and, and life is life. And that's something which is as important as any form of what you actually do on the job, um, especially if you work in the media space, because it's so easy for your life to become 24-7, just work. I've been there. You worked in television. You know how that is. It's it's taken a lot of um, coaxing on my part. I have a I have a, a very um, intelligent multitasking wife, and and and, and Pooja makes sure that I understand where work needs to stop. I uh, agree with that totally. <laughs> so and, and and so and I also think about how people need to be able to manage that. Some people say, "Oh, it's fine now. Now, now we're at a senior position, so you can say these things. You can't do that when you start off." How does someone find work life balance? In, in, in the media space of all things it's almost impossible I'll, I'll say that hmm. if 
the only way to make it work is to constantly work at it it's it's like with any relationship you can't just say that okay now this has happened and you know this is the formula i'm going to apply to it and that's how it's going to happen no it doesn't work like that there will be days when you will not be able to go for your exercise class you will not be able to have time with your family you will not be able to meet your friends so those days will feel really fucked up yeah but then you say you know what i've had a really crazy couple of days i'm going to now step back and you need to take consciously take that yeah. step and say okay maybe these meetings can be pushed here yeah. or you know or maybe this weekend i don't do anything and i sit at home yeah. but you have to take those calls and it's not there is no formula that will work for everybody what's your formula i um <laughs> uh, it's constantly changing lately well a lot a lot of netflix is involved a lot of friends meeting up is involved mm. family time is involved um i try not to miss my exercise class because i actually enjoy it more yeah. than it being yeah. just exercise so i feel that without me having to do much about it it kind of yeah. helps me a little yeah. bit i write a lot of lists <laughs> i make lots of lists and i lose a lot of them as well so which is why i make multiple backups of lists so Yeah and I actually list things like uh, make time for this and you know make make sure you do this today because honestly these things slip my mind and if I don't make time for it then I'm going to have a bad time at the end of it so I have realized we've slowly moved into this space we generally we only start off with saying okay this is a segment we like to call humans of advertising we have naturally <laughs> you know moved into that space and we're discussing but because and because i remember that we were in that work life uh, video and i remember seeing that video and i remember and i remember all the stuff that you said beyond the 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 quote we Thank spoke God. about um and what i found interesting was everyone's perspective among everyone's perspective it's actually a conversation we need to have because uh the other day i was talking to someone and i, I think yeah some one of my parents friends and they were like how did you guys survive without the internet without mobile phones and they said we had more work life balance than you ever would so have so true uh, because once you left work no one could call you unless you reached home if you decide to go out to have a drink then no one can reach you and that sometimes feels like a good thing that, always a good thing yeah it's why cyrus brocha ha- refused to have a mobile phone for years now he does <laughs> i know he does <laughs> uh, Tell yeah. me about this this <laughs> this this secret weapon of yours called list that you use. Oh, it's not very secret. Everybody does it. I I do not trust my memory. Hmm. So that started off with that, where I would just make lists of things that I needed to do every day. It turned out to be then lists of things I do need to do during the week, month, year, life, etc. Yeah. Then um, it turned out to be grocery lists to like. conversations i need to have with people then within the conversations the topics i need to talk about with it just it's also not something i've been doing for many years it's something mm-hmm. that i've just done this crazily lately mm-hmm. because um it kind of helps me keep a check on things and as far as work life balance goes it's not just the lists that help it's just the fact that um see our lives are very we're always at work in a certain sense not yeah. just be- it's because of what we do right yeah. especially if you're going to do something like it's great that you know culture and lifestyle etc extensions of my own life are becoming part of work etc but you have to physically draw the line at some point yeah. you know whether and especially if you're on social media that's terrible i'm co- I, i'll have to constantly check what vice india is up to mm. and you know somebody said left a comment there should we reply back or you know what should we do that's very stressful yeah. So which is why you need a very strong team around you as well. Mm. You need to be able to trust that team yeah. to sort of take yeah. it on when you're kind of feeling a little fragile mm. and uh, and be able to delegate. That's a new thing that I'm learning to do. I learned it a while ago. Now I'm relearning it because I have to I have to sort of retrust a new lot of people also. Yeah. So it, it's very hard. especially for a control freak how has building that team been um advice I, I, it's also in, interesting to look at how traditional media always had this whole s- specific structure uh, of how things were set up uh when in, in terms of the content space but uh for something like what it's been 8 months now yeah. at advice india and, and how has that process been and oh, and what has surprised you about the kind of people that have become a part of it and what has been 
It's been a learning curve. It's it wasn't very easy in the beginning, but I think right now we're we are settled into a nice tiny little family. And what I what what's different from traditional uh, sort of ways of working is the fact that honestly, I the CV is not the only thing I'm going to look at mm-hmm. when I hire a person. Mm-hmm. That's probably the first thing, yes. But it's also instinct. And you kind of learn to trust your gut a little bit after what six, seventeen years of working, mm-hmm. and once you meet them, and uh, you kind of, and you know, so <laughs> one of my teammates uh, who I met the first meeting, she did a lot of, she said a lot of things that traditionally you shouldn't say at an interview, yeah. right? Yeah. But I liked her for it. And that was one of the reasons I hired her. And yeah, and it's worked out great so far. And a lot of people are like, oh, but you know, she shouldn't have said that. I'm like, that's okay. You know, there was something about it that came across that I can, that I feel she can put to good use in her new role here. And, um, and again, I don't feel that you should be restricted by, oh, but this person ha- is so highly educated and has worked at X number of companies and yeah. blah, blah, blah. CV looks great. I'm like, that's not necessarily the sign of a good addition to the company it also needs you you need to meet the person you need to talk to that person you need to see how that person works together as a team you might be great on paper but you'll be a terrible team player yeah and uh, those are lessons I've learned from my previous jobs as well. And and people misconstrue culture fit as being, oh, culture fit in a younger organization means young and cool people. Absolutely it's not. not. Yeah. No, I've made enough young people who are, and cool people who don't do any good work. Uh, well, technically, then I shouldn't be advised either. <laughs> I mean, you know, this, I'm not young or cool, so I don't know. Then, yeah, which is why the janitorial role yeah, suits yeah, me yeah, well, yeah. you know. But yeah, and, and uh, youth is also not necessarily a marker for like yeah should I hire you shouldn't I hire you it's honestly like you know what is your take on things do you have an opinion does yeah. this is this opinion more than just a tweet is this yeah. I can you support it with thought knowledge uh, do you pay do you know your grammar well <laughs> do you pay yeah. enough importance to is research is an issue yes please yes yes yeah. I mean, I agree. It's great. Millennials and Gen Z are developing their own language, and it's it's yeah. not English, but you know, but still, I mean. So when still, something's nice, you don't say hard. Please, <laughs> please. There, there's a list of banned words I can't yeah. constantly come out yeah. with, and interesting is always yeah. there. Yeah. I hate that word. Yeah. Um, hard, nice adjectives in general. Avoid. Yeah. Lots of rules. <laughs> and when you talk about even in teamwork, right? Uh, what the the good parts I've noticed, and I hate to use the term this gen, this generation because I, I but I do feel in the media landscape, and I've seen this that every generation has a different way of working. They are the people I saw who worked before me, uh, my set of uh, people during during my last what what a decade or, um, and and the ones I see now. I think the requirement to do something that actually brings value beyond monetary or beyond individual seems a lot larger now than it ever was um, and that's a good thing and I, I, I and the more I see it the more I'm excited to see it to more from a general person as part of the landscape uh, is that something you've noticed as well massively yeah I mean it's also because it was sort of kick-started by our generation or my generation or even the generation before us is that we choose to do what we want to yeah, do yeah. that choice was not available to the generation before us yeah. and uh, the fact that and if we're choosing it therefore there's a certain level of interest that comes in right we yeah. are extending our own lives into this we are therefore that much more passionate about it yeah. which has its drawbacks as well like the whole work-life yeah. balance you don't know where to draw the line yeah. as to say you know this is work and yeah. then I'm kind of going to separate it um, but yeah I mean and now because of social media the lines are gone there, there are no lines you know what what you're tweeting out there what you're putting out there is also an extension of an article that you've put out there yeah. you know so it is hard but uh, not necessarily a bad thing Hmm. But I think people still need to know how to filter that into what yeah, is yeah. Uh, what what your thought. How can I make my thought into uh, less of a personal yeah. blog and yeah. more of a, an article that is, um, you know, and also not take objective. it personally when it doesn't happen exactly the way. That's you want. hard as yeah. a writer. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody's ever yeah. going to be magnanimous enough yeah. to be like, oh my god, yes, yeah. you know, that's your opinion. It doesn't matter. Yeah. You know, it it is hard, but yeah. yeah, I mean that's that's life. That it it is going to be there. I think that's even as true for people who work in the space as it is true for brands who need to work with them. Saying uh, you saw it a certain way because your brand is a certain way, uh, but if, at the end of the day, it's content first, and then uh, brand kind of coming in. If if that gets diluted, then the whole point of the exercise has kind of failed, right? Absolutely, yeah. Um, 
and I, I like how this conversation has gone from the topic we were at towards uh, humans of advertising. Then again, <laughs> back to topic we were at. Um, and and before we we wrap things up, um, I know I'm supremely late in taking a break. We're going to take a, a short break, and we're going to be right back with advertising is dead. How aware do you think you are of your laws and rights? Do you look up to laws when you are caught up in situations? Do you know what your rights are when you're stuck somewhere bad? Well, here's a show that can help you move an inch closer to being aware of what your rights are. Tune into Know Your Kanoon with me, Amber Rana. This is a podcast meant to answer all your law-related queries. Catch Know Your Kanoon every week on the IVM website or the app or anywhere you get your podcast from. Welcome back to Advertising is Dead. Um, we with Ritu Parna Som. So we're going to dive straight into what we like to call our version of the rapid fire round, which I don't know is a good thing anymore. Um, oh God, this what's is going scary. On, uh, which is uh, also Advertising is Dead. <laughs> Tell me, uh, what can you whip up uh, at a moment's notice? It you can mean, be it can be food, it can be alcohol, it can be a smoothie. What can you whip up in a moment's notice? An omelet. Uh, what's that one list that you will not take off your multiple lists? It's a new one. Mm-hmm. It's supposed to be my goals yeah. for life. Mm-hmm. It's blank. I need to fill it, and that's why it won't be taken off. Okay, I'm going to think how to respond to that one. Um, what is the book you're reading, or what would you suggest someone read right now? Oh God, this is such a cliche. I'm reading Becoming, mm-hmm. uh, and I'm also reading. Um, I'm re-reading for the I don't know 150th time Good Omens, which mm-hmm. is one of my favorite. Uh, comfort reads mm. and at any given point I am always reading Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy it's just yeah. go back again to- yeah I mean it's just I, I will I literally open it at any page and start reading because yeah. it's just it's happiness right and uh, what are you listening to music oh god okay stressful um, too many oh. things yeah Should, can I look at my phone yes please should I be like completely shameless and say K-pop I listen really? to a lot of K-pop. Yeah. Listen to K-pop. I listen to a lot of K-pop. A lot of K-hip hop. I've never understood K-pop. Oh, um, it's so okay, K-pop. I've always loved pop. I'm one of those mm. like loved Backstreet Boys, loved yeah. all that. Okay, and then uh, and then I really so whatever whatever in the middle music evolution happened, and K-pop has been a recent sort of um, introduction. I've been listening to it since last year, I think. And now I moved on from pop to rap and hip hop, which is anyway something I love. Mm. And uh, there are a few of few people I love. Palo Alto. I don't know if I'm pronouncing their names right, but yeah, I love Palo Alto. Then there's um, there's a Japanese lo-fi person called Haji, like H A D J I, who I really like. Yeah. And uh, and while I'm working, I am constantly listening to a lot of lo-fi. So. Yeah. Yeah, lo-fi works so okay. Yeah. yeah, lo-fi or metal, I've realized. Oh God, works absolutely not. Yeah. No, that's, please. That's, that's why <laughs> having a bad day. Go, go listen to some metal in between is my uh, stream of things. Um, and um, what? Uh, oh yeah, we spoke about the dictionary of words which we should not use anymore. No, please. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so we will not go back to that one. My last question to you is: uh, What podcast are you listening to? Oh no! <laughs> if you're not listening to podcasts, you should listen to Advertising is Dead because you're on. Well, the last one that I did listen to is I have to say is this one, yeah. but I am addicted to my dad wrote a porno. Mm-hmm. It's a British podcast which has um, it's just so f-ed up and lovely. Mm-hmm. It's basically this guy whose mm-hmm. father, uh, once he retired, decided to write uh, erotica. Mm-hmm. And he wrote about Belinda and mm. her adventures in a uh, pots and pans industry. Okay. okay, and it's pure erotica. So this guy, to be able to deal with it, decided to get two of his friends and read the whole novel out, mm. and it's serialized. So there's part one, <laughs> part two, part three, and it is brilliantly funny. Yeah. So disturbing at points. But such a good laugh. Yeah. So yeah, I recommend I it thoroughly. Yeah. And there are moments when, uh, you know, and his dad is not a good writer. Okay. <laughs> so there are points where he will compare Belinda's breasts to pomegranates, which then led to a whole lot of memes that led to you know the moment anybody said pomegranates, like you you, it's kind of like an inside joke. You know what you're referring <laughs> to, you know. So yeah, I, I I think people should all listen to that. 
And on that note, uh, I think we're going to call this an episode. Uh, thank you so much for coming on Advertising is Dead. Uh, this has been fun and freewheeling, like I promised you. Um, that it would not be, we, we are not. As scary as I thought it we would are be. Not, we're not scary. We're not, we're not news are. We're not any of those things. We're just fun. We're talking about the space that we all live in uh, 24-7 and try to find some balance within. Oh, God. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Uh, if if uh, people have to connect with you, um, how do they connect with you? Uh, you can follow me on Instagram. Uh, my account is Ritu Som. Mm. I think. Yeah, it is. It is. <laughs> did I just catch you on your way to work? Or did you end up pulling an all-nighter? Let me guess. You have a packed schedule for the day, the week, and probably the month and the year. That's a lot for your mind to handle, don't you think? This buzzing chaos also brings tons of negative thoughts. Am I right? Try spinning that bottle in a positive direction with me, Chetna, on the Positively Unlimited podcast every Monday on IBM Podcasts. It's time to change your life one alphabet at a time. Every week comes a show where three people come together to tell you about Stuff they like. A movie. A TV show. A book. And other stuff. Tune in every Monday on the IVM Podcast app to IVM Likes. Batman approves this message. Thank you, Batman.